Welcome everyone uh, to our seminar series for If Cyber, the University of New South Wales Institute for Cybersecurity. I am really, really pleased today to introduce you to Professor Carol Morgan. Um, I'm really excited just even by its title, but I've read the abstract and I think this is going to be um, I know I'm going to learn a lot and I, I suspect this will influence my own work um, and today uh, Carol Morgan comes to us from the Institute as a member of the Institute at the Sydney campus. He's had an extraordinary career. Um, he was at the University of Oxford for over 20 years, that's a long time, <laughs> and he acquired his PhD here um, in Australia as well. Uh, he specialises in formal methods and um, has won um, awards also in cybersecurity. So we are very, very lucky to have him at the university as well as for our seminar today. Over to you, Professor Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, and thank you for this opportunity to give the talk. Um, I'd like to say at the beginning that what I'm presenting is not my own work, and it's not even entirely my own presentation because it's based on Annabelle, Professor Annabelle McIver's presentation at the Newton Institute in Cambridge just over a month ago. Um, but behind the scenes, as we'll see later, there are actually lots of people who've been working on this, um, which I've indicated here with the flags, and later on I'll be putting names to those flags. <coughs> And the answer to the question I pose in the title, you can fit on one slide, and that's what I've done here. That's it, that is to say our answer. Make it personal, make it non-confrontational, and make sure you have a science underneath. The science that I'll be talking about is quantitative information flow which is just one way of doing these things, but it's a recent way and it's quite a systematic way, which we like because of the way it brings lots of different things together. There's been lots of work on things like this, and in particularly in Australia. I mentioned some of them here, probably haven't got them all. Um, some of the very early, well, relatively early work on this was by Sweeney in the United States in 1998 and later published in 2002 together with Samavati. But this talk, in this talk, I'll be concentrating mainly on the Brazilian work. Um, and the fact that they've used this quantitative information flow approach, which breaks away a little bit from what was traditional in this area before. So um, put some technical terms here down at the bottom, uh, Shannon entropy and differential privacy, the people who work in this area will recognize those terms. And what I'm saying at this point is that we have expanded beyond using just Shannon entropy and we are not only concerned with um, what differential privacy measures, but we are uh, working on more general things and more abstract things. The abstraction gives the ability to bring more things together. So, to get to Brazil, which is where this talk is based, um, I'm going to start by mentioning the INEP data sets. The acronyms here, of course, are Brazilian ones, um, but this stands for, if you rearrange the letters a little bit, the National Institute for Educational Research. The T is Brazilian for research. And in Brazil, what they do and have done for a long time is collect data from the educational institutions and um, publish them, that is INEP, um, both from the schools and from um, high, uh, the high schools. And they release these data sets periodically, uh, year after year. And there's lots of other data sets lying around as well. And they are public because this, this is the tradition in Brazil. Recently, however, so we also slip back to the last slide. Um, the red line there, this talk is uh, motivated, well, the work that this talk is described is motivated by the fact they've passed along Brazil, which comes into effect just this year, in fact, around about now. It's a bit like the European GDPR law, but it makes it actually a crime to de-anonymize um, things too much. And so the INEP, which is the um, institute that deals with these things, uh, has to take this very seriously. So on this slide, I've given an example of um, 
the main features of this, the, it's the main, main educational statistical survey in the country, but it is anonymized, so they don't have people's names in there. There's lots and lots of uh, records there, uh, tens of millions, and it's so-called longitudinal, which means that there are a series of databases um, that relate more or less to the same data, but perhaps at different times or to the same people, but different bits of data. And all of these things are lying around there at the same time. And as we all know, um, part of the issue is what happens when you put those things together. You think one bit of data is um, fair, is fine to release, but what you don't realize is that there are other data out there that are also being released and that people can put things to these things together and then make inferences from those that you might not want them to make. So let's look at something um, specific to see what's going on. I've just put together here a very small database. It has just 10 people in it um, so that we can see what precisely I mean when I'm talking about a database. So a database is a collection of rows. These rows are um, numbered one to 10 here. Uh, the ID there is, so to speak, anonymized. That means there is a person who is responsible for the data in row one. In other words, a person who is 25 and who is female and, and uh, works for a company called company number one, let's say, and uh, is not sick. So this is a, just a small example. And the things going on the top there, the column names are the attributes. So the attributes of the person number one are that she is number one, she's 25, she's female, she works for company one, and she is not ill. So this is the kind of stuff that's published. The published data for the educational database, of course, is much, has many, many more rows, um, millions, and many, many more columns too. They put the most astonishing things in there, actually. But the question is, why do they publish these things? Why? Um, part of the reason is that there's a tradition in Brazil of transparency, which is very important. Um, but the other thing, of course, is that they want to develop policy based on what they find from these data sets. So this is the reason that these things are published, because they're useful and they're safe. Why are they safe? It's because the ID there on the left-hand side, you can see with the green around it, is anonymized. So nobody knows who this female is at number one or this male is at number 10. Although they know certain things about the person, they don't know who the person is. So it's safe in the sense that it is protected um, from people drawing inferences about particular individuals in the community. And then people do uh, various statistics on this data, like how many people are doing this, how many people are sick, how many people work for that company and so on. And then they formulate policy on that. So this is the motive behind why people do this. But it is useful and that it's safe. But of course, the question is, is it really safe? And the answer is, it is not. And people know this, but they don't know what to do about it. There are many approaches. So we say, for example, on the left there, that it's anonymized. Yes, it is, uh, one to 10, but still each row is potentially identifying. Um, if, this, if this database contained uh, all of a certain set of people and you could find a person in there who was female, 25, uh, was sick and worked for uh, company number one, you would know who she was. So you would actually have translated that too into the name of a person. And then from there, you could get all the other data about that person. So even though the ID is anonymized, it is still possible to figure out lots of things from databases like this that we really don't want people to know. That's one thing you can do, this de-anonymization. Um, the other is that you can actually draw inferences from here. For example, in this small database, you could ask the question, um, if you're 25 male, what is your occupation? And the answer happens to be number two. So you can, from some facts about a person from this database, infer other facts about that person, even though you don't know who that person is. I'll give you another example on the left there with female and your occupation is three, are you sick? 
Now, um, this might in itself not sound like a problem, but it is a problem because, for example, if you were considering situations somebody was where somebody was trying to hire a person and knew certain things about that person from the data that the person supplied during the hire, but did not know, for example, whether she was sick or not, still the interviewer might be able to infer from this database that the person was sick and perhaps therefore discriminate against her by hoping to hire a healthy person. So these are the kind of things that go on. And the point I'm making here is that there are actually two kinds of threats that we're dealing with. The anonymization, which is when you find out who actually belongs to a particular row. And the attribute difference is called, whereas even without knowing who the person is, you can conclude that if they have certain characteristics, then they are quite likely to have other ones. So this is the situation that we have been dealing with, all of us, for decades. And what's happened recently in Brazil and in other places, but this is a study from Brazil, is that they have um, formulated a law and uh, it's sitting there at the bottom and it comes into effect this year. And so the INEP, which is the organization which is collecting and publishing this data and processing it, is worried about breaking that law. So that's their problem. And that is actually why they came to the UFMG, which is the university, federal university in Minas Gerais in Brazil, where this work was done by an MSc student. They had a good working relationship with INEP already. So that's one of the social aspects of what I'm describing here, that um, you have to have a good working relationship with the politicians or the policymakers in order to have any impact on what they do. The researcher's task was to help the education department become aware of the scale, but there were still some skeptics there um, who needed to be convinced. And what I'm going to show you now is what, the, what our Brazilian colleagues told us is more or less how this process went of convincing the people who were already on, they were already on good terms with, nevertheless, that there was actually a problem here that needed to be solved. The person on the left here, the mathematician, this is uh, Gabriel and Mario, who are people mentioned at the uh, beginning, and I'll mention them again, they're the Brazilians. Um, the skeptician, I've called it, is uh, the person in app, and they have a conversation about this. So why does the INAP guy have a problem with this data? Because there is this law, which now could result in INAP actually breaking the law if they do not properly protect the privacy. And the researcher, of course, the researchers are interested. Tell me something about it, he says. Well, they say, we've done lots of interesting research on this. And then, of course, <laughs> they need this solution very quickly, like yesterday. Actually, in this case, it was six months. Well, that is a problem because the issue of releasing data but protecting it from uh, inappropriate use is very hard. Nobody actually knows how to solve it yet. There are lots of approaches, lots of um, examples, lots of trials, but nobody knows how to do it. So the problem you encounter then is that the, um, the skeptician knows a little bit but actually, a uh, little knowledge is dangerous in this case. He says in this case, we know about the birthday paradox, you know, he's heard of that. But that's not real problems, not with our data. And so this, the academic says, well, in fact, we've shown that um, I can re-identify myself from your data. And in fact, the people in Melbourne who actually who did a trial on this with the um, transport system identified themselves. Okay, so that's showing that it's possible to identify, to de-identify um, individuals, but that's not good enough because the skeptician knows, well, there's always going to be one or two outliers, you know, we're not really worried. And up to this point, the conversation is not going particularly well. But now we get to the point, which I mentioned earlier about how to do this, and it's to get personal, but to get personal in a nice way. 
And they actually did this. So they actually identified in the database the son of the person they were talking to. And that makes it personal. And the skeptician says, well, oh gosh, that's, that's a fluke. A fluke probably couldn't do that for somebody else. But in fact, they went on to show that 80% of the students in the data set can be identified with a very simple attack. So there's two key things there, two key social things that are going on. One is actually the son of the person they were talking to. And secondly, that person is only one of 80% of all the people in the database that can be identified. So now the attention has been focused. Now, again, the skeptician grasps for some uh, technical terms. K anonymity is something that is uh, used very often here. It was invented by Sweeney, as I've written up there at the top left. And it is one of the first steps towards saying what it means for data to be um, safe. But the academic says, well, in fact, we've been doing some research on a more recent approach to this, and we call it QUIF. And we would like to see whether we can use that to help you. So what they're going to do, what they did rather, is use QUIF to look at this particular problem, but QUIF had not been used to that point on a problem of this scale, of this, these tens of millions of people. And there's so many attacks, so many scenarios and so on, each with its own jargon and so on, that one of the contributions that QUIF was able to make was to bring things together and treat things in a uniform way, but still it had to be done at scale. So we want to get practical and we want to keep it simple. So just to remind you, there are various kinds of threats here. There is the de-anonymization threat, where you find out which record belongs to which person. And there's the attribute threat, where you can infer something about a person um, by other characteristics that they might have, even though if you don't know who that person is. And there are two, so to speak, threat vectors. One is just attacking, so to speak, a single database. But in fact, databases can be aggregated. You can take several databases and put them together and end up with something that is much more um, potentially harmful than either one of them would have been on its own. And a good example of that is RoboDebt, for example, where the Centrelink database was put together with the ATO database and then some uh, bad things happen to lots of people. So it turns out actually one of the things that Quiff can do is reduce all of those things to, or each of those things to one example. In other words, one is a special case of the other. But at this point, I'm going to shift gear a little bit and tell you a little bit about Quiff. There will be slides coming that have uh, examples with lots of numbers on them. I'm not going to be dwelling on the numbers and going through arithmetic, but since the slides will be recorded in the talk, I'm very happy to, to explain things later on or even uh, later by email if people are interested. Um, but just to repeat, this quiff technique is relatively new and had not been tried on something of this size before. So you can see there's lots of aspects of things there that we could be doing with quiff. So this was the attraction of this research that has already been done using QUIF on something the scale of the INEP data set in Brazil as it happens. So here's what a simple scenario looks like for an attack of this kind. There's a priori knowledge, that's the knowledge that's sitting in the, in the database. Here we've just got a single database. Then there's a single database attack where the adversary uses sometimes auxiliary information that's lying around somewhere else to obtain sensitive information on the data holders in the database, information that he or she should not have been able to obtain. Um, the result of that is um, so-called a posteriori knowledge, which means um, that you know more about the individuals and their characteristics than you knew in the green a priori on the left-hand side. So I'm going to show you an example of that because this is a typical, a typical way that things go. We've got a database here of people in there and they've been um, de-identified on the left. I've indicated that there by making them silhouettes. So all you can see is their shape. Don't know who they are. But it turns out 
that you can see some of the characteristics, of course, because this database happens to record things like whether the person is fat or not, and whether he wears a funny hat, and whether he likes padded gowns. Now, that's all you know at this point. But then there are, of course, other databases lying around, social databases. That's actually what they are. Things like Facebook, TikTok, newspapers, and so on. They are databases too, because they contain individual information about individuals. And you can actually find somebody who is fat, likes padded gowns, and wears a funny hat in there and find out that it's Henry VIII, and then conclude that this person in your original database had six wives, because that was one of the things that was in the database. So this kind of thing of, car, of, of um, collecting together various databases, linking them up, and then drawing conclusions that nobody expected you would ever make, be able to make is typical of this situation. In the original database, it was known that somebody had six wives, but it wasn't known that it was Henry VIII. Only by putting this together with Facebook, let's say, was it possible to figure out that actually this man on the right with his funny hat had six wives. So the QIF approach to this <clears throat> has four basic keywords, three of which it shares with most other work in this area. And the fourth one, which I've put in italics there, hypers, is a new contribution from QIF, QIF, which I will illustrate in a moment. The prior is what you know beforehand. The posterior is what you know by making your inquiries. The channels are the way the information gets out. And the hypers are the way that we process it. So here is a small example showing how this works now with numbers. <clears throat> so I've got a little database here. The IDs are indicated with question marks because it's been anonymized. We don't care what those numbers are. <clears throat> but there's five companies here where these people might have worked before, number one through five, and each of these people is either sick or not. So this just looks like a random collection of data. I've sorted it here. It's the same data, but I've just put the rows in a different order. So you can now easily see that half of these people are sick and the other half are not sick. So what we do with this in QIF is to organize this in a particular way. So this is quite a busy slide. <clears throat> and I'll just go through and show you where all the pieces have ended up. The database is collected together in the matrix just left of center that says occupation along the top and seek or not sync along the rows. The prior on the left there, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, is what's recording the fact, just slipping back here briefly, that 50% of the people are sick and 50% are not. So we know that from the database. Now, from that database, doing a bit of arithmetic, we can see that if a person is sick, then he's one fifth, if you choose them randomly, he's one fifth likely to be working for company one, one fifth likely to be working for company two, and so on across the row. And you can do a similar thing for the not sick at the bottom. And one of the contributions of QIF is that on the right there with the posteriors, in other words, what have we learned by looking at the person's occupation is that we have only three columns there instead of five. So the amount of data has been significantly reduced here. And that's because by using the um, features of QIF, we can collapse columns together when they're actually telling us the same thing. So what we know now is that two fifths, with two fifths probability, we will have a 50% chance of guessing whether a person is sick or not. But with three tenths probability, in other words, working for company three, we know that they will be sick. And with three tenths probability, collapsing the fourth and the fifth column, we know that if they work for company four or five, then they will not be sick. This is what we call a hyper distribution, and it's the basis for this particular QIF approach. The question is, what can you do with this? Well, if you do a little bit of arithmetic, you can see that if you choose somebody at random, just based on the information that's in here, the average probability that you can, from a person's, person's occupation, correctly guess whether they are sick or not is 80%, which is extraordinarily high given the innocuous nature of that data. The way the arithmetic is done is the bottom left on this slide where you can see there's three possibilities. Two-fifths of the time, 
you will have a 50% chance, that's the one half of figuring out or guessing correctly whether the person is sick or not. But three tenths of the time, you will know that they are. And three tenths of the time, you will know that they are not. So in each of those cases, the information that you glean by interrogating the database improves your ability to guess whether the person is sick or not. And if you do that little bit of arithmetic there, it comes out to 80%. So back to the INAP case study, what, we, what they were trying to do was to impress the importance of that vulnerability on the INAP people. And this uh, graph here on the left-hand side, it's blue and it's red, is how they did that. So I'll explain this graph and then explain the impact it had on, on the INAP people. So um, at the bottom there, the bottom row, is the number of quasi-identifiers used. Quasi-identifiers means which attributes are you looking at? Are they sick or are they not? Do they work for this company or do they work for that one? Um, you can look at just one or you can look at a combination of two or three or four or five and so on, all the way out to 10 and 11, which have been squashed together there. And this graph shows you, if we just look at, say, the column labeled five, it shows the probability of identifying a row in the database, saying this row belongs to that person, based on just looking at five identifiers, five quasi-identifiers, five attributes. Question is, which five? <clears throat> well, they looked at them all. So they took all combinations of five identifiers from the information that was in the database, and some of them turned out to be fairly harmless. And so the percentage, say, of um, attribute inferences you could make in that case was very low, down zero there. But in some cases, it was very high, going right up to the top there at 100%. So there were some combinations of five attributes which allowed you with 100% certainty to figure out who a particular person was. And this is one difference, for example, with the research that Sweeney did before, where she had an idea in advance of which the sensitive attributes were likely to be, and she investigated those. In this study, because computers have got much faster, it was possible just to check them all. Now, if you look at this, you can see as the number of identifiers used increases, the concentration of dots moves towards, up towards the 100%. The blue and the red in themselves don't have any significance. They correspond to how far um, you up are, are up on the scale on the right-hand side. But obviously, the point is to make, the, make an impression on the inner person here that you know, red is a bad idea. And so if you go from about, say, eight across, you can see that most of the things are above 60%. The intensity of the color is how many of the combinations of eight quasi-identifiers actually end up at that level. So you can see that not only um, are these dots getting higher, they're getting more and more intense because they're piling up on each other. If we look at, say, nine quasi-identifiers, 10 actually, you can see that almost all of them are at the top there. So in other words, if you take 10 quasi identifiers, almost all of them will tell you exactly who a person is in that database. So the point of the whole exercise here is what is shown at the bottom right there. The LGPD privacy legislation, which in English is the General Personal Data Protection Law, is putting INAP at risk of breaking the law. And this picture on the left has been produced by applying quantitative information flow techniques to the data, to the actual data in the tens of millions and has shown them that they're in the red zone. And so they are really now interested in doing something about it. And this is the social aspect. So what I've shown you very quickly is a little bit of what the problem is, a little bit of the new approach that QIF gives us, although I went very fast through there. And I finished up here with the social aspect, which is how do you get these guys to believe you, to take your advice, to take action? 
as I said at the very beginning, the university in Minas Gerias already had a good relationship with the inept people. But as I illustrated in the conversation, there was not necessarily a meeting of minds until some, um, you could almost call them tricks were used, identifying the son, not of the person doing the investigation, but of the person in INEP. Um, but the point of the talk is not so much about quiff, although it gives us significant advantages and it's a good test for that technique. It's about how to enable the people that should be our colleagues, people in government, people who make policy and so on, to, who can therefore by legislation and by changing practices do something about all of these risks that we put up with every day and give them the data, the, the means to convince others to do the same. And diagrams like that one on the right that you can see there with the red and the blue are genuinely shocking to those people. They had no idea. The um, actual attribute they're looking for there is, does the person use public transport? You can see at the bottom in Portuguese. So this is where we end up by open mouth, jaw dropping, oh my God, had no idea that we were this vulnerable. So did it work? Well, actually it did. So the central paragraph there, the Brazilian Ministries Agency is now actually considering replacing its current publication methods with new techniques that can provide formal privacy guarantees. They know that if they do that, if they fuzz the data, to put it informally, that it decreases the utility of the data. This is precisely, for example, the argument that's going on in the United States at the moment about the census. They want to apply differential privacy there, but they're being criticized because if differential privacy, which is fuzzing the data, making it less useful, is done too much, then what's the point of having the census? So it's not clear what to do. This is not a solved problem, but this is a study that has already been carried out. This is not a proposed study, this is an actual study. And the, the effect on the Brazilian ministry has already happened. What we want to do is to give them a scientific basis for doing this so that they can um, present a credible front to the population that they have to deal with and get them to come along and agree with the measures they intend to take. So this is basically the end of the talk. I want to make it clear who did this. It was basically one person, Gabriel Nunes, who is an MSc student at uh, Minas Gerias, that's a province of Brazil, um, the university there. Uh, his supervisors were Mario Alvim, also there, and Professor Anna McIver, who is here at Macquarie. Um, those words there are the Brazilian words for supervisor and co-supervisor. Um, but also working on there are Natasha Fernandez, who's here at Macquarie University, but also at Lix in Paris and me, um, and we will be publishing something about this very soon. But there are many more people than just those four who are involved in this. And I've tried to summarize most of them. There's about nine or so people here. And at the right there, you can see that there is actually a book on the science of quantitative information flow, which describes how um, we've used those techniques to help carry out this study. And that's the end of my talk. So back to you, Monica. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk, um, Professor Morgan.